Okay, I'll get started. Our slideshow today is on First Samuel, and we're going to look at the major characters. But there are minor characters, and we are going to look at a few of them because every character in this book is unique and has a great story to tell us. So, first at this slide, we look at where they fit within the chapters of the book. Hannah's story of prayer begins in chapter one. Samuel's story as prophet picks up in chapter two. Saul's kingship confronts us in chapter nine. And the anointing of David pops up in chapter 16. And as each one of their narratives comes in, it layers on top of the whole story which will bring us to David's kingship in 2 Samuel. Hmm. Robert Alter, a scholar, said the writer feels free in 1 Samuel to invent an inner language for the characters, give their dialogue shape to weave together episodes and characters with a fine mesh of reoccurrent phrases and analogies of incidents. I believe in 1 Samuel, we can see ourselves and our actions in at least one of these characters, and their story can enliven our own inner prayer life. When we look at the composition of the books of Samuel, you notice there's not any Deuteronomous phraseology, which means those writers did not have as much of an input into that book. And the only thing that makes it harder is that it's earlier, it's harder to find out when it was composed. However, we think the final writing of the books of Samuel were in the 8th, 6th century BCE, perhaps during the Babylonian exile. During the exile time, people were looking back on the experiences they had had uh, that had brought them into exile. So writers were more prolific reflecting on that. But it's also thought that someone had access to the court records of David or Solomon also had some input in the book. Originally, the two books of Samuel were one book. And the division into two is to believe to occur around the second century BCE. The rationale for the place of the division between uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel was to conform to the custom of a book with the death of a, ending with the death of a major character. In Genesis, Joseph dies at the end. In Deuteronomy, Moses dies at the end. Therefore, when, Samuel, when Saul, the first king, dies, that's when 1 Samuel ends. However, the ancient Hebrew title Samuel arose from the fact that the great prophet was the leading figure at the beginning of the book. But the two book arrangement created a strange circumstance because Samuel is not even mentioned in the second book of Samuel. Uh, next slide. Thank you. We're going to start off with Hannah, who was a woman of prayer. And I really like the fact that she begins this book of uh, for Samuel because there's very few books in the Old Testament where a woman's story is at the beginning. But Hannah's prayers are central to a major change that's going to take place, which is what this book is all about, that the Israelite judges are going to turn into Israelite kings. Now, scripture scholar Brugman noted, Israel's waiting for a king ends with Hannah's waiting for a son. Those who read the narrative are invited to listen and to notice that in the middle of this waiting, both hope and receiving can happen. The narrative is a witness to God's transformative power which creates a new historical possibility where none existed. 1 Samuel is about the waiting of Israel for King David. But within this time, there is no emptiness. God is filling this waiting period with his power of new beginnings. Now, Hannah's story begins when she and her husband 
went to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to God. And Hannah's in distress because she went with uh, also his second wife who had two children and Hannah had no children at all. And she felt that she was supposed to have children. So if we can go to the next slide. So she prays this prayer. Uh, sorry. She prays a prayer in her distress. <clears throat> And during the time of prayer, Eli the priest is there. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. But Hannah said, I was praying out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Now in this, Hannah's prayer is direct and she's filled with a belief that God answers prayers. And I used to think that her prayer was, when I read it, was like bargaining with God. If you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. But most commentators, which makes sense, says that this is a gift from God and she's giving this gift back to God. That she has this belief that she has been called to be a mother and that uh, she feels that possibly this is the time for it. And timing has a large part to do in this story because everyone is waiting for God's timing, especially David, we'll see at the very end. So after her son is born, she, she gives it back to God. He starts working in the temple. But this is only one of two prayers we see in Hannah in uh, 1 Samuel. The second prayer is called the Song of Hannah. And it's probably one you've heard of because it's a lot like the song of Mary uh, when she was told she was going to be a mother. It's called the Magnificat. And this is song is taken from Israel's shared hymns. Possibly it was from the period of the monarchs to celebrate victories. This would have been appropriate use for the song of Hannah in this book because Samuel, her son, was going to be anointing kings. He was going to become a king maker. The other thing I found really interesting is that is in this prayer, this is her own personal prayer to God. But also she used a set prayer, a set hymn. And that's what we do in prayer. We have our own personal prayers to God, but we also use the Psalms, the hymns to pray to God. So in that way, we're a lot like Hannah. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Samuel was building a bridge between judges and kings. And we've talked about the word call, that they, that uh, Hannah felt a call and she thought her son had a call. But this time we're going to focus on the word listen. Because our story begins with a priest, Eli. And Eli has not listened as much to God in his old, his uh, age, for he's more of a senior than he used to. And he's also blind. And they think the blind means that he had a weakness in communication with God. That was kind of a symbol. Anyway, Eli's sons were corrupt, and he knew that they probably would not succeed him. And a man of God came to Eli and said, your sons aren't going to succeed you because they're corrupt, have immoral activities. But so he went to them, and they did not listen. So then Samuel came, and he started growing up in favor with God, and he was actually learning under Eli. And I'm sure you remember when 
God called Samuel three times and Eli had to say, it's God, you need to listen to him. And so Eli learns from Samuel that God told him that his sons would not be the future priest. And then at that point, Eli must have realized that he was training his successor to be successor to the priesthood, which would be Samuel. Now, scholar Stephen Champman in his book on First Samuel really had an insight into Eli. He stated, Eli's portrait conveys remarkable sympathy for him, even while the judgment against him and his family manages to appear accurate and just. In addition, this change in leadership is not due to any positioning for leadership by Samuel, but rather to fulfill his call, a call to service, to listen, and to obey God, who is beginning a new venture. So Sam, Samuel was the person that God was putting forward, not because he was a son of Eli, but because he wanted to make changes as well as the people did, and Samuel was going to be the one to be the bridge, bridge from being a judge to a king. In our next slide, we have a reading on covenant and monarchy, because how is this new king going to work out for the people? Was he going to be spiritual, or were they still going to have a priest, and then the king would just help them? What was occurring at this time was Israel was becoming a nation, but it wasn't a big nation, and it did not want to be overrun by other nations. So they thought with the king, they could become a nation of their own. But God was warning them in this reading through Samuel that, yes, you could be a nation and have a king, but you still were part of a covenant with God. And that was just as important, if not more so. So in this reading, which is from Samuel, he says, But when you saw that King Nahasha, the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No one but a king shall reign over us. So the Lord your God was a king. See, here is the king for whom you have chosen. He's talking about Saul, from whom you have asked. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and heed his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not heed the voice of the Lord but rebel, rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. This speech Saul has already been made king. So this speech officially closes the time of the judges and initiates the time of the king. And just before this speech, Samuel had talked about all of the things God had done for them and why he made that covenant and why the covenant was so important and it was important to keep it even when they had a king. But how was this really going to work, having both king and monarch? Uh, the scholar Stephen Chapman says, Samuel's speech to the Israelites communicates that there can be no protector of justice or keeper of peace who does not also lead Israel in worship, and second, that leading Israel in worship requires honesty, a spiritual sense for God, and a deep awareness of Israel's overreaching story. But will King Saul be able to fill these qualifications? Next slide. Thank you. So we're going to talk about Saul now because we have come to him. And he becomes king. And really, Saul's anointing is like a bit of comic relief because Saul goes to Samuel because he is looking for his father's donkeys. And has been told that Samuel is a seer who can tell him where his donkeys can be found. When Saul gets there, Samuel hands him a kingship, but not the donkeys, because they've already been returned to his father. So it's kind of like a little bit of a, uh, like I said, a comic relief, something that kind of eases the situation. But we are told in this um, part of the story that Saul, uh, Samuel has made his choice based on his communication with God. 
Saul is not enthusiastic about becoming a king. But he is established as a king, and there's a threefold uh, confirmation of this. He's secretly anointed. He's uh, acclaimed by the public that they want him as king. And his military victory, is, they feel, is the work of the spirit. So they think that he should be their king. And during his reign, Saul had some military achievements. And that's what he was looking for, that Israel was looking for. They wanted to establish themselves as a legitimate nation. And they believed that God was present through him or through the work he did in the middle of their battles. However, we, right after this period, we see that Saul has some weaknesses. It's going to be a really problem area for him as king. Uh, during one battle, Saul vows to kill any Israelite who eats that day. And out of fear, Saul's subjects confront, conform to the vow, except for his son, Jonathan. <coughs> he did not know the restriction and vow violated. Jonathan expressed no regret in violating uh, the fast, for he understood that soldiers need food to sustain their energy. But the people would not let Saul killed Jonathan because he didn't adhere to the vow because they, they loved that he helped them in victory. And at this point, we see Saul's jealousy. His jealousy because they're, they're pointing towards Jonathan, who could possibly be the future king, and that he's doing better in leadership for them on the field. But what really changes or the worst for Saul is that he had a broken appointment. That's our next slide. In this one, before Saul would go to battle, he would, he, Samuel, he and Samuel, would sacrifice to the Lord in hopes that they would have victory in the battle. And so this one in 1 Samuel 13, 11 through 14, Samuel says, What have you done? Saul replied, When I saw the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Madras, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gigal and I will have no, not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering which is something only Samuel should have done. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel says. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. So this narrative brings us back to the words we heard from Samuel in our last reading, that there's a definitely a relationship between king and between priest or, or prophet. And the people and the king has to be obedient to both, not just the king. Now, was this because Samuel did not want to give up some of his power because he had to do that when he saw a king? And that will always be an issue lying underneath, not knowing if that was part of it. But at this time, the kingship was suspect because it was brand new. And so there was some authority given to Samuel as a prophet and a former judge. But also we might see in this episode a bit of Saul's weakness as a spiritual leader because he indicates during this episode that he doesn't have a lot of rooms for spiritual realities. He's more involved in the battle. He's, his entire worldview is shaped according to strategic considerations of war. And possibly the sacrificial worship for him is just a formality for victory on the field to be observed and not a genuine act of worship. So he would have initiated the sacrifice because he just thought he needed to do so in order that God would be there on the field, but he didn't feel that 
closeness that God would be with them, would be part of them when they go into battle. And that's something that a priest would, would have uh, brought forth, that, that God was part of this. God was part of their life. And maybe Saul just saw him as a good luck charm or something that he had to do. And this would bring us to David. Uh, David, I, these are his early years. I picked that because usually when they, on TV, they talk about the early years and the later years, or when they write a book on someone, they talk about the early years and later years. But for this time period for David, it was probably the hardest time of his kingship because once he was anointed, he was a king to be. He, even though he was not on the throne, he was a king in waiting. And just like Hannah waiting for a son, David was waiting for his kingship. And his selection was very different from Saul's selection. When Samuel came to anoint him, David wasn't looking for his father's livestock. He was tending to it. And as king, Saul always was second guessing his abilities. But David would never second guess himself until he was approached by the prophet Nathan for the incident. David's relationship to God would be strong, whereas Saul's relationship was weak. One question which comes into quite a few commentaries, which I kind of uh, spoke on before, was if he had not had the power struggle that he did with Samuel, uh, would Saul have been a stronger king? Something we'll never know. So I'm going to take us into a story that we all know, I bet. The story of David and Goliath. I think that was one of the first stories I learned as a child. Okay, she's talking about David now. Uh, <clears throat> oh, go back. <laughs> We're not on David of Futures yet. This is the story of David and Goliath. And it's a well-loved tale where David, with a slingshot and a rock, overcomes Goliath with his armor and weapons. And one thing I noted in the story this time is that David first tried on the armor of Saul. He ready to need to be armed and he gave him a spear. And David tried it and said, I can't even breathe or walk in this. So he took the whole thing off and he took to battle what he knew and what felt comfortable slingshot and his rock. And of course he won. And this prompted three things to occur when he did win. There was a struggle between Saul and David that ensued because all the people were overcome with gladness that the Philistines with this one one-on-one -on -one battle had helped them and win the victory. So they had this wonderful kind of parade or, or celebration for him. And Saul could see that David would be someone who would probably come after him and someone who was a rival. And from that fourth point forth, David is, would be running from Saul within his life. The second thing that occurred was that Micah, the, Saul's daughter, was the first one to marry David. And she married David after this. I think for Saul, it was to kind of ensure that maybe he could control David, but that wasn't going to happen. But also for David, Maybe he felt that this salt solidified that he would become king at some point. But the third thing was that Jonathan and David became friends. Now, Jonathan, as we heard, was the king's son, and he did well in battle. And he probably would have been a very good king, but he wasn't chosen by God for that. But even though he wasn't chosen by God, he probably knew that David was in the future going to be king. He assisted David throughout his trials and tribulations when he was running from Saul as a fugitive. So it was interesting that one of the scholars said on David and Goliath's story that Goliath foreshadows the struggle that David will later have with Saul. David is beginning to enter a time of waiting and suffering, persecution and flight in order to submit to God's own timing. And that's what this next one is about, as David the fugitive. During his time in flight from Saul, David had two chances to kill Saul. And he did not do it in either one of these chances. 
So I'm going to read the first one from Samuel 24. The man said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscious to for having cut off a corner of his robe, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. You kind of know that as the cave story where they both end up in the same cave. And that was part of the fact that David realized that his biggest temptation would be to kill Saul before Saul should actually die and he should become king. Because there's a difference between killing a former king and trying to, to, spare, to keep your own life. And this incident, David came upon Saul. It wasn't deliberate, oh, I'm going in there because Saul's in there. It just happened that they, in this story narrative, they were both there at the same time. Let's look at the second narrative. This was on chapter 26. So David and Abishma went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear struck in the ground near his head. Amner and the soldiers were lying around him. Krishna said to David, today God has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike, strike him twice. But David said to him, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed? This occurred a time after the first one, and David must have been tired because he had been running from Saul for quite a while. And this was his chance kill him, more so of a chance that wasn't just of the moment. Now, what we don't see here is chapter 25. And chapter 25 was brilliantly put together by the writer because chapter 25 is a totally separate story. And you wouldn't expect it to be put struck right in between those two chapters. Uh, no, go back. Uh, okay, that's okay. Okay. You wouldn't expect it to be struck in between those two chapters because it's a it's a story about Abigail and Nobel. Now Abigail and Nobel were living in a city that David and his soldiers came to. And Abigail's husband loved his possessions. He didn't believe in God and he only cared about himself. And so when David came to him and said, I'll protect your possessions, but I would like a little bit of um, what we would call a bounty or a gift offering. Uh, the world that was not going to do that. Uh, he wasn't interested in, I, I, to me, it seemed he wasn't interested in having a godfather in his life. Uh, and in this part of the story, we see a different side of David. He isn't the righteous person because he wants something for what he's giving. And um, one of the commentators said something I thought was really interesting. He was a lot like, um, I think it was, uh, let's say Jacob, that he, he knew how to, to uh, thank you, murals are helping him. He knew how to manipulate. He, was, he knew part of his character was to, was to connive, and he knew how to use that. And that wasn't a bad thing. When we look at all these characters, just because they have certain characteristics we wouldn't want to have, those make them full characters, and there's no bad guy and no good guy in any of these. It's just people being, God being in their lives. So anyway, to get back to the story, Abigail, the wife, comes and negotiates with David. Uh, again, we see her being very wise, and for a woman, very shrewd with common sense, something you don't see in the Bible all the time. And she negotiates with David saying, you don't want to kill my husband because it would be unwise for a future king. And David ponders this advice and realizes in some way, death is in God's time, not in his hands for this incident. 
possibly this incident helped him in Samuel 26 to realize Saul's death was not in his hands, God's time and in God's hands. So after Samuel 26, we see Saul, who was still trying to get David, goes to a seance at Endor. At the seance, we see the ghost of Samuel come up, according to the story, and Samuel predicts Saul's death. And it's really interesting that you steer this story near the very end. Now, on Samuel 26, when David spares Saul's life, that's the last time they see each other. But the fact that Saul sees just the ghost even of Samuel brings the story around where it began with Samuel and it ends with Samuel. Samuel became a king maker and Samuel became the king breaker because he predicted the death of Saul. And now that Saul is gone, we are ready for, to see David's reign. And we will see that in 2 Samuel. I want to speak just a little bit, though, for finish about the different characters, the uh, minor characters in Samuel. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first one we talked about was Eli. Remember, he was the priest, and he guided Samuel through his first encounter with God. So he was really important in doing that and getting Samuel ready to follow God's calling. And then we look at Jonathan, and in the story, he protected uh, David from Saul, and he and David were very close. And one commentator noted that this is the only person in the whole story that David, when he died, when Jonathan died, David said he loved. So they were very close. Michael truly loved uh, David when he, she was his wife. Uh, her father gave her to someone else after they, she, he got upset with David. As long as she was with David, she protected him from her father. And then, of course, we just saw Abigail and Nabal's story. And it reminds us that vengeance belongs to, not to us, but to God. That's what the commentators say. And then we see the medium and indoor. Now, a lot of different people call her the witch. I use the kind of nicer uh, note, note about her. But what was really important what a lot of the commentators said about her is that she wasn't part of a bad part of the story. She was just moving the story along to the end to Samuel's death. But I think she also, this whole story with her, kind of reflects the, flat, the fact that Saul's whole reign was tragic. Tragic for him and probably tragic for the people. And whatever could have been done to make it better it just did not occur. So he's kind of like when you see the tragedy of the prophets, the tragedy of the first king. I think these, and there's so many other minor characters, these are just a few. So all the minor characters bring out one characteristic within a major character. So whoever wrote this really knew how to write minor characters to back up major ones. Now I'd like to just mention some of the, uh, some of the commentaries I looked at for just a second, in case you're interested to Look a little bit farther. So next slide. Thank you. Uh, the first commentary is the Anchor Bible Commentary. Now, most people think that is a really hard one to read, and that includes me. But the person who wrote First Samuel in this series did such a good job. The writing from the Hebrew to uh, English is just easy for me to read, and his comments and his commentary were really good. It just kept you going. Uh, the second one was uh, the first and second Samuel interpretation Bible. Again, like I said in Jeremiah, he's, he puts incidents together even if they go across chapters. So you know where a story ends and where it begins and what it's about. Um, first Samuel theological commentary, that is an excellent one because he doesn't put the scripture there, but he tells the story tells what he thinks the story's about. And he's a fairly new commentator. He has some good concepts in there. Now, um, what I found to read, actually read the story of David, First and Second Samuel, was a translation with commentary by Robert Alter. He has one small book of his whole commentary series just for David. And he does a really good job 
with the footnotes telling you what the Hebrew word could have meant instead of the one that was translated. So you see there might be a little difference in the way a sentence comes out in English. And then the last one is the reading the women of the Bible. And I put this on because in here, this um, uh, author, I, I'm not going to say her name because I know I couldn't, I couldn't say it correctly. She really flows with the stories of the women in the Bible. And she gives some meaning to them. And she relates women of the Bible to a previous story within the Bible. So let's take Hannah. Hannah was uh, being uh, pressed uh, by her second wife of her husband because she didn't have children. She was made fun of. And we see that with Sarah. But we see how they differ. Even though they may have something in common, a storyline, the reason for their storyline is a difference. So she is an excellent one. And she has different women in the Bible, not just Sarah, not just Hannah, but all kinds of women in the Bible. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the handout you all got. Uh, on here it has the resources and it also has the questions. So they're on this next slide. Uh, it's reflection questions. Um, next slide. Thank you. No. <clears throat> next slide. No. Thank you. Um, in each of these, I put down a major character and some prayers that you could start on reflection on. I, you know, you don't have to read the whole story of the character. Uh, for me, it was just reading one of the stories within the character because each character has a part of, uh, has different partial stories within that character. So if you read the prayers of Hannah or just one of the prayers of Hannah, can you think about how they touch you, how your prayer life is like that? And then on Samuel uh, and his calling, you can reflect on what God is calling you to do in your life. I think during Samuel's life, there was a lot of change. God called him to do a lot of different things. God is now calling us to do a lot of different things. So I could relate to him what he was going through and how he wanted to remain a, a judge, but really God was calling him to get the kingship started. And that had to be hard. The change had to be hard in his and then on Saul, you can see how he really didn't have God as part of his daily walk. He may have believed in God, he may have cared about God and respectful to God, but he just didn't have God working with him in a day-to-day -day reality. And a king had to have that to survive as a king and as keeping the covenant with his people. And then I put one in as, as Saul and David and the love of God and how it's important in your life and how Saul did not see the love of God. At some point, the spirit was taken from Saul and David got the spirit. So David felt that love. How does the love that God gives you in your life, how is it important in your life? And the last one again is the, the other characters. Uh, again, these I put up are the ones that we looked at, but there's so many of them. And they can remind us of ourselves or our situations we've been in. So that's another part of the story. So the last question I had, last slide. Thank you. Which character speaks to you? Is it Hannah? Is it Samuel? Is it Saul? Or is it David? And we don't have to talk about this question. I'm not sure how much time we have, but not a lot. But if there's something else about the story that interests you or something you'd like to share, I'd love to hear it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> that was a pretty amazing, that was a pretty amazing gift you gave us, Linda. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and you know, I, I, it's, there, it's really a great, that book is a great gift of the Old Testament. And I didn't realize it until I started studying. I always just thought of David and Goliath and one king to the next king. But there's just so much within there. Uh, and it did have one other part, the Ark of the Covenant. And I, there was no way I could go into that. That would make its own form because that stretches across a lot of the books. But this 
this book is just amazing. I'm sure parts of it have been made into plays. Uh, like uh, one commentary person said that uh, Shakespeare probably picked up his witches and bubble, bubble, turn, turn, that, those witches from the witch of uh, Endor. Macbeth. Yeah, Macbeth. So uh, probably some have been picked up by authors. Question? Sure. Um, when David cuts off a corner of Saul's robe, yes, he realizes he shouldn't have done that, and he has second thoughts. Yes. And then he rebukes, they use the word rebukes his men and tells them not to attack Saul. Why do you think they use the word rebuke? I mean, he's the one that did the bad thing, not the men. Why is he going down on them? I guess I think, and I'm using this for my work experience, don't do as I do, do as I want you to do. You know, um, if I do something wrong uh, and then someone else says, you know, you did that wrong. Hello. I say, well, you shouldn't do that. And that would be, you know, I think he was saying, okay, I made a mistake. Don't do this. Or, I don't okay. do this. I just thought the use of the word rebuke was interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Well, Maybe well, it's maybe the, the men wanted. <clears throat> well, I was thinking that maybe the men really wanted him to kill Saul on the spot, and that's why he, you know, to follow through with something rather than just cutting off the robe. And he, re that, and that might have been why he wanted to rebuke them for not, you know. He didn't want to be encouraged to do that. I don't know. That's just a thought. That occurred <clears throat> to me too. And I think that's what's good about this book is. There's no right and wrong, but we can look at it and look at it within our relationship with God and say, this is where it hits us. This is where, what matters for us. You know what gets lost a lot in this whole scenario is the relationship between Jonathan and David. And I have held that in my heart forever because it was such a pure love yeah. And, I, mm -hmm. and I don't think we, I don't think we look at that enough. Hmm. I agree. I agree. Remind me of Ruth and Naomi. Mm -hmm. Some ways, yes. but I think it was maybe close. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I also think of the talk about a really deep love and faith is, is Hannah's um, desire, to, so strong desire to have a child and then to give him up. I, I just think that's an uh, amazing love uh, that she had and faith in that she was doing the right thing. Faith in God for giving her the child in the first place. And I think she went on to have other children after that. But still, that was her first. Yeah. She did. She went on to have... Uh... I want to say six or seven children, but definitely many more. Yeah, but she didn't know that at the time. No, and I thought um, that it was she was really strong personality because she followed through on giving up that son, not knowing. That yeah, not yeah. Have any other children? That had to be hard. Impressive, impressive faith. <laughs> 